Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this uh, very special Procure Plus seminar, uh, sorry, webinar. Um, so today we are very lucky to be joined by our three Procure Plus award winners from the 2016 edition of the awards. So presentations from uh, Nina Bergman Madsen of the City of Copenhagen. Uh, this was the award winning um, Sustainable Procurement of the Year, um, an organic food procurement. We were followed by a presentation from Leon Smith of Transport for London, and that was the Innovation Procurement of the Year um, for a lighting procurement. Finally, we will be joined by uh, Jerome Van Alphen from Vatterstadt, and that was the uh, Procurement Teacher of the Year, and uh, was for the A6 Motorway Procurement in the Netherlands. So before we go on to our, uh, our presentations, I just wanted to remind everyone that the POS Awards and what they're about. So the Procure Plus Awards have now been running for a number of years, and uh, we have three categories, as I just mentioned, and they are Sustainable Procurement of the Year, Innovation Procurement of the Year, and Tender Procedure of the Year. Right here, uh, this year's awards are actually still open for entry, so I would encourage anyone who's, uh, who has some excellent procurement stories to tell uh, to please um, jump onto the Procure Plus website at procurepost.org forward slash awards. And you will find all the details of how to apply. Uh, the closing date, as you'll see there, is the 30th of June 2017, so a few weeks from now. And uh, the ceremony itself for the award this year will take place at the EFIP event on innovation procurement in Tallinn, in Estonia, and on the 17th of October. Um, yeah, I hope uh, people who are with us today are inspired by these wonderful presentations and are able to, to submit it to yourself this year, and uh, it'll be great to get a, a good number of excellent procurement practice to share with our, with our work and beyond. Um, so I think any sort of further ado, I'm going to pass you now across to Bettina for the first presentation. So I'll pass you across. And um, over to you. But take your seat to unmute yourself if you're on mute. Hello? Okay, you can hear you now, Bettina, yes. Good. Hi. Um, so I want to talk to you about the Green Public in uh, the um, yes, Copenhagen did a fruit and vegetables procurement um, a couple of years ago. Um, I need to figure out how this works because I really have computer problems uh, right now. I'm sorry. Um, wait a minute. Um, work at all for me. I'll give you slides for you if you like. Um, you can because it's all locked for me. Yeah, please do. And you can well? Uh, yeah, so um, it's, it's just the slides Perfect. maybe if you can't. Oh, sorry about it. Um, Next, please. <laughs> Perfect. Um, in Copenhagen, have 90. Your microphone might have just gone there. Can you hear me now? I can hear you now, yeah. There's something to stop out there. It's really, it's really, I'm sorry about the that's connection. Okay. It's fine, we can hear you now, so uh, that's good. Okay, I'll hurry a bit then. <laughs> but, the um, road to 90% organic, uh, we did by a training of staff to cook differently than we used to. Usually we just uh, reheated frozen food, but now we cook from scratch and we educated our kitchen staff to do this. But to follow up on this, we also needed a change in procurement 
we need to the market to follow us because now we are going to buy more organic food than we did before and use more food and vegetables. Next slide, please. You know, I told you that there was a travel. It started in 2001, and in 2001 we reached 60%, 2011, 70, 75%, and in 2015 we were aiming for the goal of 92%. We had a goal right now, or we reached our goal right now almost because we are 89 our public news policy. Next. We, uh, 80,000 daily meals, um, we have 925 locations, and um, yeah, there's a lot of viewers on the food. Uh, so this, of course, have a lot of meaning to the market that we now convert our tenders into organic tenders. Next slide, please. So as you can see here, we use more fruit and vegetables in season, less meat, more potatoes, and so on. Uh, I bring this up because the thing I'm going to speak about is our food and vegetables. And this has a very huge meaning to our kitchen, that they have variety and food and vegetables in the season. So it's, uh, it's also the award Next slide, please. I do not know that much about food and vegetables or how to cook it correctly and what about seasons and do we have different kind of apples? So we work with a conversion cons consultant uh, and they work also with the, kid the kitchen. So they are like the man in between the law and the contract and the cooking in the kitchen. And we really close together and this also um, how we build up our contracts. They help us write the specification and the right uh, demands to the vegetables. Next slide, please. But this is the work between us, the kitchen, and the conversion consultant. We also have to work with the market because if we've got a new tender and the market is not prepared, then they're not ready to meet uh, our demands. So, to uh, starting to write tender, I always um, talk to the market. I um, try to make them ready for what's coming and I hear what is the possibility. Maybe they have thought of something that I did not see, and that action and the conversion consultant did not see. A solution to our uh, problems, what our new way of thinking that we did not see ourselves. In fact, we of course work with suppliers from at four annual meetings and talk to them about uh, the new political demands and what we want for the future and how we would like it. And then we also talk about them of how they will meet our demands. Um, so this is if we try to develop the market and the market helps develop us because they see things they did not see and vice versa. So um, yeah, while writing the tender, I have a market dialogue. Uh, I, I tell them where you're going and why we're going there. And the period uh, of a week where they can um, put their requests to me. Then I consider if, if this is the municipality, uh, what, we, what we would like to ask for our new channel. And if so, I put it into my agenda. Uh, um, and I write my tender finished and I publish it. So I publish my tender, I will have one more meeting with the market. And this is like a monologue meeting where I tell them why the tender material come out as it is right now. What the criteria have I put into it and why have I put them into it and uh, how does they fulfill the demand of the politicians and of our kitchens. Next slide, please. Meeting, the last meeting I talked about, uh, the, the suppliers are not allowed to uh, ask questions. They do it in writing afterwards and then they will answer in public so everybody can see the question asked and the answer. And my log can speak about uh, the gender material that will be recorded and published. We know for price the best price. We are, you often get what you are paid for. So we for best for less value. We test quality 
and we have an expert testing it. Often it's shipped from our kitchen or people who run out food. And then we always have the focus that it should be measurable. And how to make that measurable? Because it's social quality, but when the right people, they often know what quality is the best. And then always about the material. So you have to put it into your specification also. What do you want? So you put the diversity that you want of your food and vegetable tender and the um, tender you're making into your specification so it's measurable. Next slide, please. This is my chart. It's not very big, but it can see a lot of written in one of the columns. This is from the fruit and vegetable um, material because in the beginning, it would be very nice just to have one green apple and one red apple. By a conversion consultant, we'll get paid all year in Smith all year because that's what's easy to get. Um, and I thought, why? Because there's a lot of different red apples in season. And if for apples in season, they will just give it to me. He says, you cannot be certain of this. So you have to specify that they are allowed to bid in with more than one kind, and you will actually have to ask for it. So this is what I did in this, and I asked for more than one kind of apple, one kind, one kind of plant, all different kinds, and then they would of how many different kinds they could offer to me. So this is you see on this picture. This is where I specified a lot of different kinds of apples that they could uh, put into the tender. I did not say that they should, but this was just inspiration. Next slide. Here is a kitchen for elderly. They are uh, dealing with some of the plums because they are in boiling in the sugar water so that they will have uh, plums for all uh, year. And they should be smooth and vegetable and in season. Um, we don't want just one or two of pears, apples, and plums. We have a lot of different kinds. And we wanted the, the suppliers still in a season uh, wheel, uh, a wheel of season, we call it, because Season is not the same every year, but the suppliers are the ones most likely to know when the food and vegetables are in season. So they were told to be the of when the vegetables are likely to be in season. And most likely because it's not the same every year. It depends on sun or rain or whatever. You should um, always leave a possibility for the season to vary a month or so. Um, but this um, came out really well. Uh, we were offered a lot of different kinds of apples from, from the suppliers who, who bid in. And, and, and it is very, very happy kitchen because now they get a variety into their cooking. It makes their cooking more exciting and it's more exciting for the citizens. But this was the one to regulate the price, of course, because all those do not cost the same. It depends on uh, how many. Um, you pay on the market, and uh, it, uh, the variety has uh, been troubled by any kind of diseases or so. So we still struggle with uh, the price, and this would be a really good thing to uh, into how to regulate price uh, in season. For that's just something that we are going to try to work on in our tender. Next slide. Here you see posts that I did not know that existed before. Um, story is told that apple can last until between two years in one of these apple hotels. Everybody tells themselves, of course, um, it will not um, be as um, rich in vitamin, even if they say that it is as fresh as it is as harvest. Um, these are pink lady that you can get from here. They are wonderful apples, but it would be very nice to have some of the varieties that you can see next to the picture. Um, so that the uh, next slide, please. I know I talk a lot about apples, but we eat potatoes in Denmark. It's one thing that are in a very uh, high thing in, in, in our menu, and uh, therefore we also have a lot of different kinds. And what for this, we did not ask for it to be things. I just asked the season from wherever the supplier got their food and vegetables. But that because of transportation and it's expensive for the supplier to transport 
different kinds of apples and pears and plums from all over the world. It came from Northern Europe, which also gives us a good meaning in environmental sense. Next slide, please. My list of uh, all the some of all the apples they um, gave to me. Uh, in the first line, you can see uh, where I specified that it should be apples. Next line, you can see all the varieties of apples, all the different kinds. And then we specified which month we could uh, expect to buy from. Then we specified how many kilograms we could expect. And then we specified where it came from. You can see most of them come from Denmark and Holland, some, some from Italy and uh, Chile. So this is the news for us uh, to see, and uh, of course we have to know where it comes from because that's something you need to know of, uh, of food also. And then um, I was giving this point um, that they could win the tender on how many different countries they were offering us. I also wanted to uh, be able to call the suppliers if they were having a stock. So this was kind of a test. It was not as I uh, wanted them all to come from uh, in North France or Germany or somewhere else. Next slide, please. In, in the material, in, we uh, tested um, the the quality of the, the sliced fruit and vegetables. It's hard to test an apple, if it's a good apple or a bad apple. It depends on what you prefer and also the, the species. And, and the Granny Smith, it tastes like a Granny Smith. And simply these will be tested like a completed effort. So we cannot really test the quality. We could test it on herbs, and we did that. Um, but you have to write it very clearly what you are testing, how you will be testing it. Um, but it's like a you also have a station, at least in Denmark, saying how how it should be chopped or, or uh, how much. Work. Or use it should be uh, in 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 the back. so so you can also look at this next slide please and here you see the evaluation sheet it says that we test the color how it looks how it smells the taste the consistency of it is it a soft or is it a chewy um, and the size of it is it cut in the correct sizes and how what is the total view of it and then rate it and then we take the, the the middle value, and we have five or six people rating it, and then uh, it comes out with a total score that we can use for for evaluation. So this is also uh, the way we work with it, and I can go much more into this if, if anybody is interested. Just call, contact me. Right, please. And this is just uh, what we tested. It's in Danish, but you can see we have a lot of herbs, and then we have uh, oranges. Apples, and, and it's because it's very hard to cut the birds, so they have a nice uh, slice. So next slide, please. So testing. Here you can see, also it's not um, the testing panel are not supposed to know which fruit vegetable they are testing, and from which supplier, of course, what <laughs> they're testing they are supposed to know, but not from uh, which supplier. So this is what you can see that we uh, anonymized it. So it's from ABC, and, and I have to record into that. So it's only staff who's handling it. Uh, so of course, skilled uh, professional staff, kitchen staff, handling the goods so that it will be served in the correct way. Then the testing it do not know who it comes from. Next slide, please. Yeah. So even we have now seasonal fruit, we have now a uh, a lot of different apples in our contracts. There's still a lot of things to work on because we have a lack of knowledge uh, on uh, on the goods that I'm procuring for. The more you know, the more you know what you know. So uh, there's still a lot to learn, and I think it's very important that we learn from each other. That's why I also think this web thing. Um, we also have a lot of uh, lack of knowledge um, from the markets. So I should keep up my market dialogue, even though we're a very well-functioning contract. Um, see what are the possibilities and the going. How can you small and medium-sized firm into our contracts right now? It goes for mostly to, at least in Denmark, 
which goes mostly to our big uh, companies, um, we would like to ensure that small and medium-sized firms in future also have a chance to bid on this. So we divide it into smaller subplots. Um, mm. But then we have a lack of resources in uh, developing uh, the specification because time and uh, at least uh, as in all jobs, time is money. So and uh, sometimes they also uh, expect uh, that we can save. Uh, huge savings on procurement. Uh, at least in Denmark, it's, if you procurement that you already done once, so they expect that you have a saving in five percent, and that's most possible and definitely not weak. So this is also a uh, project over and over. And that is, even though we couldn't convert it from uh, conventional food until organic, we did not use any more money in our kitchens. Now we do the organic tender one more time, and they think that's money to to say it's really uh, something. Uh, organic food, uh, when people usually do tenders, they do not do 100% organic tender. And that uh, sometimes exclude um, some suppliers uh, that they will um, not have the possibility to bid. Uh, so you really have to look into your market to ensure that you have uh, the right uh, specification and that you do not mix too much. Um, and then, of course, uh, uh, yeah, prices always have to be an issue, and, and you have to look carefully what you ask for and how you ask for it. Next slide, please. For the future, I would like to look into food miles, and if it can be a part of the evaluation, this is something that we talk about in Copenhagen, at least. Um, we want to support small and medium-sized firms. We want to be, uh, help them get a chance to uh, bid into our contracts because one of the things I'm also uh, um, looking at is creating relationship between uh, the user and the producer, between the children and the farmers, and this could also be some of the small SIS firms that could help with this. Uh, I would like to look into if we can be better to tell what, yeah, what time, then we can for example, if I know when I'm going to buy the potatoes, maybe I can make the potato tender before the field planning so that the farmer can plan uh, ahead, and then he can say this field is for the municipality of Copenhagen. So this is some of the things that I'm working with, but uh, it takes a long time. So next slide, please. I hopefully show, and this is some of the things that we help each other with. The InnoCat project helped me a lot with my food and vegetable tender. I know the uh, also found use in it, and we uh, use a lot of time to, to share. So this was one of the projects that we helped. I hope that uh, there will be more, uh, that uh, we can help each other uh, spread the public procurement guidelines uh, and uh, some of the other good things that are going on. Thank you. Thank you, Bettina. Um, that was great. And um, I, I should have mentioned maybe at the beginning of the presentations, just um, if anyone has any questions at any point during any presentations, just to um, send them to me using the chat function you'll see on your screen. Um, so if anyone has any questions now, just uh, you can start in them just now. And I have a few myself first. So I'm um, just one question. So you talked at the end um, just about planning for the future and for looking at um, the next possibilities for, for future kind of organic food procurement. Um, how much time did you spend before this particular um, procurement on the market engagement and how, how far in advance were you beginning your activities of, of, of dialogue with the market? I think I started uh, like half a year ago before I started the actual tendering period the market okay, because I, of course or had some market dialogue in advance. Okay, and you're ready of, of some of the, the major suppliers, but um, did you have any other methods of, of trying to discover any suppliers or other maybe SMEs at the time? We always uh, ask the one supplier that I'm already engaged with, what are their, um, um, what, what competition do they have in the market? Our, we have some organizations that uh, help uh, organize small uh, 
produce and, and, and I asked them who would be interested in a tender like this. Okay. And um and in terms of just trying to make sure you're sort of transparent with that when you have your supplier engagement activities, is was there any particular ways of recording the, the sessions or recording how you were in dialogue with them? Yes, in the beginning we have uh we have like a system in Denmark that is online that we use when we also publish our tenders. Um it's ID Ubud, it's I think it's Danish, but I think you have similar. Um and, and then we keep the dialogue within the system. And I uh, have my meetings, I record it. I tell the people who meet up that this is a recorded meeting and that we will publish it afterwards to keep the petition uh, fair. Okay. Maybe just one final question from me. So um, you, you, you talked about the, uh, the sort of saving 5% and trying to trying to um, make sort of savings, but obviously you're also talking about the quality over price here as well. So, uh, how, how did you actually manage to convince your your budget holders or decision makers at the time of this to to um, to go down this line of of looking at the, uh, the the quality more than the price? It's pretty easy because when you look at the prices of the bits, they uh, they are alike. So, not the prices that makes a big difference. The price will rise slowly because that's how uh, our um, how it, how our economics goes, but an apple cost, but an apple cost. Um, so so it's not that hard. So when you say we want the best quality and everybody wants the best quality because everybody knows somebody who will eat a public meal sometime, and they, they want it to be good quality. I say of course when the prices are so um, close to each other, then it's easier to uh, argument that uh, it's uh, that you should have a, a huge weight. Thank you, Bettina. Um, just conscious of time, so I think we will uh, we can yeah. move on to our next presentation. But if anyone has any questions for Bettina in the meantime, send them to me, and we can uh, we'll have time at the end, hopefully, for a few uh, questions for the, the, the three presenters together. Again, thank you, Bettina. So, so we want to Leon now. So hopefully, he's now been passed the presenter rights by my colleague. And, and Leon, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Okay, great. So we have you there. And uh, I think you wanted to try to use your camera to do it as well. Oh, yes, thank you. Thank you, everybody, for joining in this presentation. I hope you can hear me well. Uh, a little bit about myself. I'm Leon and I um, currently work for Transport for London. And over the last four years or so, I've been leading on a European project called ProLight which is what we're presenting today. I've uh, also been working in collaboration with other member states, so including Italy, Germany, Spain, and the Netherlands. And the ProLight project itself was uh, funded by the Green Commission over a period of years. So that's the next slide. So the Green Commission, um, in fact, the, the, the project is about um, us as organizations engaging more effectively manufacturers to procure better and more innovative products and services. And we through essentially through better communication with, with our clients. Uh, we study ProLight is on lighting, um, but the that we developed is equally applicable to any other technology that um, a public sector organization might want to procure and as a total the, the, the different organizations based in Italy, Germany um, and the UK spent um, just over 1.5 billion euros on um, on um, but the patient I'm going to give today is mostly focused on what we do in the UK. The process that we developed uh, follows a generic um, numbers which I'll go through today but ultimately what we're aiming to do is procure products that will demonstrate the best whole life cost and performance and as the presentation as a, as I go through the presentation you'll be able to see what I mean by this. So the first step which is the, what we call in the internal demand analysis is essentially us trying to work out as an organization our assets 
are and try to develop what is called a category strategy. Those who, of us who work in probably more clear about what we mean by category strategy. But essentially, it's us trying to um, understand how much we spend on a particular type of technology um, over a given period of time and how we can use that spend to get maximally from a marketplace. So in our, um, first, uh, we looked at what is our out of our stations and a lot of the work that I did is on the underground because that's where for Port for London um we spend it online and we to our activities to improve our customer satisfaction in the demands of our expanding business. As you know London is a forever growing um uh, city and you know, have uh, eight to ten million people live there in during the week, and um, you know we service uh, a number of those of the people living in London over that time. Um, to also increase the feeling of security for and also to live up to our legacy, because um, London transport has been going for now for 150 years. In terms of lighting, what we wanted to do was to uh, design for individual environments, use multiple layers of lighting to guide um, um, passengers through our station to save and to, and to make our, many of our passenger journeys more interesting. And the next slide here tries to uh, explain a little bit what we mean by using layers of lighting. So you have ambient lighting, accent lighting, feet lighting, and orientation lighting. In reality, this is what it looks like. So this was a trial of um, that we installed at Cannon Station, which is one of the underground stations. And um, that's what we are, the effect that we're trying to, to achieve. For example there. But only the first piece of analysis that I did when I started working in, in Transport for London. So for our procurement of a new or more advanced set of lighting technologies, we're actually trying to improve the value that we get out of those um, the technologies. So if you look at um, the two bars, uh, where uh, above escalators, if you look at the two bars to the left where we pair a T8 um, LED, uh, technology, which is a fluorescent tube technology in comparison to a LED technology. If you look at the higher, what we um, have called uh, over a period of time, if you were to use those different, two different technologies, uh, the difference that you would be able to see in terms of price um, for different technologies. And we have the same process to different uh, areas across the London underground in order to see where, um, from an investment in technology, where we're getting the most value out of technology. For the London underground and for Transport for London, in terms of importance, so we're focusing our effort in trying to improve uh, or get value out of our ask these types of technologies, you can energy cost is not as important as as the cost because um for the organization that's operating service um services twenty four hours now, it costs an amount for us to be able to maintain a technology once it's um installed on our network. In terms of priority and the entire Importance when we're looking at um, some different different technologies. This is how we try to rank or, or try to um, a preference scores. And we what the state of the art technology uh, there are on the market. We um, could uh, come into reports and um, identify what the different technologies were from. 
the understanding that we got from our internal analysis and our understanding of what the state art technologies are, we have some early market engagement. So to engage the markets, what we did is we put out a market sounding prospectus, which is basically explaining our taxes in Port for London in terms of writing, and um, put out an e form, which um, supply to report information on, on their different products. That, um, we did inspire manufacturers to actually provide us the information about a article in Lux Review. Uh, we uh, gave presentation at Lux Live, which is Europe's largest um, live um, and so um, engaged Europe's Light and Industry Association with their 200, I think 250 different members. So this is from our market analysis. Sorry. On over 350 different lighting products from many different manufacturers and suppliers from across Europe. And uh, from across Europe, Asia, and North America, and I've uh, um, laid out there to show where the response were received from. Uh, good information on all of the product types of interest. See the, the right side of the screen, you'll see the, the, the common technologies that we use across the across the network, and we see good information on all those different types. We are in under the annual turnover of the organizations um, that would be interested in supplying us. Um, so, majority of the organizations um, turn up than ten million pounds a year, and you know, as an organization, we're spending you know at, at least a million pounds a year on lighting. So we understand who in, in the market will be responding to our tenders and what tender might have on a bid for a manufacturer to to respond to that. We looked at how long these different manufacturers have been working on the market. So 35 35% of the market market sampled have been for less than 10 years, 75 less than 50 years. Um, we received good information on the different types of technologies available, and we got 90% of manufacturers actually focus on LED technologies, which gives us a, a direction to take in terms of what type of technology we want to install on our network. Uh, of the products are sold five years warranty or more, and 90% are sold with three years more, so it gives just the indication on what type of warranty we should be asking for the products that we are going to procure. We have about a sort of marking that they had, so the European markings, standard markings. Another interesting fact was that 79% of manufacturers actually rely on other suppliers to So there's a misconception amongst you know, particularly some engineers within our organization that if it has a Toshiba or a Sony or a similar branding on the front of a uh, product, then all of the parts inside are actually made by that organization. And a lot of the time, that's not the case. That dispels some of the misconceptions inside the organization. We also looked at um, the just uh, that. Uh, accompanied um, some of them at a couple of slides. So what we did then was, based on all of our information, the information that we gathered from the market, information that we understood about how our organization spends its money, what um, value um, we need to get out of these products, we present all of that information back to our suppliers and in April 2015, so you can see a picture there of our construction for
for um, Transport for London Prison 2. I think that was 80 or so different light, light manufacturers to where we are looking to achieve maximum value or spend on drugs. So if I went into um, you know, all of the feedback that we received from all the manufacturers and suppliers, we developed our requirements, uh, developed a number of technical specifications um, that reflect the type of technology that we wanted, and we and developed our procurement documentation as well. Um, the specifications were sent out to the market uh, months in advance of the procurement activities so that the manufacturers were able to prepare themselves to um, create technology that were, uh, would be able to demonstrate the best whole life cost and performance as we previously articulated to them through communications that we've already had with them. So then we were to procure the different technologies that is procurement and followed essentially three step process. We did um step A was the pre qualifications, at which point we got just I was fifty four um suppliers that responded to that step. Uh, we narrowed were able to narrow it down to about thirty different suppliers. Um at step B where we um invited the um by invitation to attend them. Uh, information about 170 different products, and which we called the in situ assessment, when we invited manufacturers that had been successful at the early stages, send in products to Transport for London that so our engineers could assess them hands on. Stage, um, our engineers looked at, you know. Well, the, does the product that the manufacturer um, documented first that actually reflect the, the product that we received when we received it hands on, and they tested it for the variables that you can see linked on this slide here. So in uh, June 2016, uh, awarded contracts for a number of lamps and. Uh, for a product that will demonstrate the best whole life cost and performance. I will do contracts for up to eight years. Um, and the, pro the contracts allow for a product refresh, which actively incentivizes innovations and improvements to technologies to reduce our whole life costs. It manufacturers that improve their technologies. Um, award contracts to about five different manufacturers for each of the different product types. Uh, three main suppliers and two reserve suppliers, and then five of those three suppliers and two reserve suppliers are able to participate when the, the lots are fresh. So we're able to keep up to date with the latest technologies. And competition with us to make sure that we secure the best prices and the best technologies. And we will write our own TF warranty, which the manufacturers have signed up to. Um, which we will get the price that we expect to to get. So this is a, probably the, the greatest representation of what um, we achieved through the procurement. So this is an example of one product type of one of 16 types of products that we procured. If you look at the bar on the far right hand side, that is um, the most um, common product of that type um, installed in London, London Underground, and those are the costs associated with it. And that is the unit cost, the installation cost, the main cost, the energy cost, and the carbon cost, and the cleaning cost, so all those costs, which is the whole life cost. And if you, uh, it's product C, you can see that there's a staggering or substantial difference between the two boxes. But most importantly for the transport building, if you look at the sections, you see that you know we're saving quite a substantial amount in terms of its costs is where 
London Island's largest costs are. So to apply that more practically, if we were to take Charing Cross Station, which is in central London, and were to take out, um, the existing buildings and replace them with the products that we now have on our framework, we save 25% in terms of whole life costs, and save 75% in terms of maintenance costs. So the water have been awarded to about 15 different manufacturers for about 45 different products with necessary variation within that. And the majority of TF Transport London's requirements. And what we've also done is the products are now mandated for use across the underground. So from now on, any new installation of line in stations across the underground, these are the products that you'll find. And what's also really compelling about the approach that we've taken is that factories, that one contractor have really come back to us to inquire about how they can improve their product to continue to reduce our whole life cost. So, uh, I'll skip this slide. Um, in, um, this case study is guidance in the EAFIP um, toolkit. And also a couple of articles that are published uh, by Lux. And, um, next is um, essentially creating a race to the top for a catalog of, of uh, that will be used as, in the same way as the line products that we identified across the whole of Transport to London. Um, uh, I've been given, given a budget and a team to essentially duplicate the process for a lot of other technologies as listed on the left hand side here. And for attention. Thank you very much, that was, that was great. That was really good. It's a um, comprehensive look at just this that whole the whole layer of, uh, of innovation, innovation procurement. Um, I remind if you want to send any questions just through by by messages, just if we if we so. Um, I'll leave again. Um, so um, one of the things that interested me was uh, you did quite a comprehensive um, sort of market engagement process with the the prospectus and articles and presentations. Um, but you got a really good response, judging by the sort of 70 suppliers and the number of products. What what would have been a, a typical response, do you think, um, if you hadn't done such a comprehensive uh, market engagement process at that stage? Um, you would expect to see your usual um, in, in the, the usual suppliers that are already engaged with um, Transport for London understand our processes, understand what type of technologies that we want. And, you know, some of our environments are, are, you know, from a conventional environment. So we're, you know, we have deep tubes that run underground. And in those, um, you know, high temperatures. So some of the technologies that you'd find that are, are um, so cool hardware store. Can, cannot be cannot be used. So we have a number of suppliers that we uh, approve continuously. Uh, so we were just to see maybe four or five different suppliers competing, which is good, is fair competition, but not necessarily when you're trying to drive the market to um, to produce a product that will, will you know your cost essentially. So uh, we're quite lucky in. In that we took and the, and the response that we got. Okay. And in terms of um, the innovations, what was the was there any particular thing that really surprised you that, that sort of resulted from that process in terms of specifications or any other functionality that maybe you wouldn't have thought of before? Not me particularly because I'm not really a light engineer, but our um, light engineers and our main staff who actually participate in the procurement exercise. When they um, opened um, some of the light fittings and the, 
the technologies. They were, you know, um, are about um, how you know advanced these te- technologies were and how um, easy them um, will be uh, how be able to be retained on the network. So please, from that perspective, to see that they were they were happy with the, the technologies and the, the product we received. Okay, uh, just one final question, and maybe on that note a little bit. Well, as um, you talked about the, the product refresh, and how does that actually work in practice during the, the course of a, of a framework contract? It's more difficult for me to, <laughs> than <laughs> I can explain the hair. Um, so it's all written to the tender documentation. Essentially, what it is, um, uh, given the times within the eight year framework, we said that we will use the same tender process, the same tender documentation, specification and we'll set back out to those manufacturers and they were able to resubmit the information uh, we submitted previously and if they ha- their technologies have improved then we rank the products. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay, that's great. Very interesting. Okay, very much on that was that was great. So I'm just conscious of time as well. So I'm going to now move on to your own. So um Hopefully, he presents her privileges. Um, Jerome, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, great. Can so we can he- hear you. Yep. So, over to you. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, thanks, uh, Leon and Dina, for your presentation. Uh, and I'll tell you something about the uh, the, uh, the purpose award we won, uh, which was on the uh, 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 public procurement of his and uh, one speci- uh, specific project, which is A6. Uh, which I will tell you something about. First of all, shortly, what well, is Rijkswaterstaat? Uh, not, not everyone is familiar with it. Uh, we are the exec- executive agency of the Dutch Ministry uh, of Infrastructure and Environment. Uh, we make sure you can drive on our roads and, and sail on our uh, um, waterways. And we protect the Netherlands from flooding. Uh, and we do that by uh, uh, um, uh, design, construct, uh, manage, and maintain the the, the road network, the water what networks, uh, uh, the waterway networks, and also the environment in which they are embedded. Um, we do build ourselves, so we procure a lot. Uh, and there are some basic principles. Uh, first of all, we we use functional specification. Uh, which means we don't ask for a specific technical solution. Uh, we just ask for you have to build it and how you build it, which type of concrete or S to use, it's up to you. Um, all these are based on life cycle costing. Uh, um, uh, we use design and construct and, and BFM contracts. It's a design, build, uh, finance, and maintain contracts. So again, uh, when you get the, uh, when you win the tender, you have to design uh, uh, the project yourself and, and build it, and sometimes even maintain it for 30 years. And uh, when we purchase, we use the most economic advanced uh, tender, which I'll be about uh, uh, right, uh, right now. Uh, yeah, it's uh, uh, well, meat means. Um, most economically advanced advantageous tender, uh, which means we don't uh, tender on less price. Uh, uh, a combination of price and quality. And three uh, quality uh, topics in a tender. Uh, sustainability is always one of them. And two might be risk management, uh, might be uh, uh, less hindrance. Uh, the Netherlands is a small company, so that when you start uh, um, uh, building, you get a lot of hindrance, and when you have a good idea of, of reducing the hindrance, you can get uh, uh, points for that. Uh, of course, these uh, selection criteria, uh, they must create some competition, uh, must be easy to understand, and w- there should be uh, uh, some differences in, in quality. And uh, it's with Two uh, two instruments. 
is de carbon uh, performance ladder. En ook al. En uh, just to give you a short uh, uh, introduction about uh, the, the meat calculation. I'm not sure whether everyone's familiar with it. Uh, so first of all, on the left side, you see the reference model. Uh, from every project uh, we start, we make a reference ourselves. And for this, it's a project where you think it would cost about, uh, three and a half million euros. Um, and there are three uh, uh, quality components uh, in it, which you can earn some fictive discount on, on your price. Uh, and the fourth one is the carbon performance ladder, so it's the red one. The three gr uh, green ones um, are the fictive discount um, um, topics. So in this see uh, tender number number three, uh, it doesn't have the lowest price. It's even uh, the uh, uh, the second most expensive. Uh, they add a lot of uh, quality to the project. So the yellow part, uh, which is the fictive price. Uh, you can see they uh, had the lowest fictive price. So in this case, uh, tender number three will win this competition um, and will uh, build the project for us. Of course, they get a, a total amount of money, so that they do get uh, uh, not the fictive price, but the real price, of course. Uh, so how do we measure it? Um, so, uh, uh, we use the, the carbon performance ladder which is a, a certification scheme for uh, yeah, on company level, so not really on the project level. Um, it's about uh, being aware of your energy use and your, your carbon emission um, to, to the first uh, step of the ladder uh, by just knowing where your energy flows are and, and what uses uh, your energy. You maybe have a list of how you can reduce energy, uh, but not really big steps um, up the ladder um, until uh, you are at the fifth rung it means uh, uh, you you make a lot of effort in reducing your energy use uh, even have an, uh, uh, an, an invent of your most important suppliers and their energy use but it's all an approach um, try to get this this carbon emission as low as possible and when you are on, on the fifth red letter, uh, you get always 5% discount, fictive discount, or uh, tender price. Um, so to go back to the first one, uh, that's uh, the red part uh, where you can earn this 5% uh, of your discount price. Uh, the, the next end is Dubokalk. It's uh, actually uh, a Dutch word, but it means a sustainable construction calculator, and it's a tool to measure the sustainability of a, proje a project in an object objective and standardized manner. Uh, well, to be used in awarding criterion in a procedure uh, procurement process. So, how do, um, uh, you know, a dog it calculates uh, the environmental impact of the different infrastructure designs uh, um, based on material and, and energy use during the whole life cycle. Uh, which means uh, when you calculate a project, uh, we give you the reference and we say we think about so and so of concrete will be needed and, um, uh, um, and um, asphalt. And you can use those numbers to put it in uh, Dubokalk. Uh, and then you can use different types of materials. So you can use uh, choose different types of uh, concrete. Uh, and with every type of concrete, there is a life cycle on concrete uh, uh, specific uh, environmental impact, and uh, B has a lower um, impact. Um, um, uh, actually multiplies uh, uh, the tons of concrete multiplied with the specific type of uh, uh, concrete you've chosen. Um, 
of Dubukalk is uh, uh, we call it uh, uh, an ECI, an environmental cost indicator, which means in the end uh, when you're finished with Dubukalk, there's one price coming out of the of the calculator, um, and we use this price again in the uh, in the median. So the lower your environmental cost indicator is, um, the more points you can get in your um, uh, in the median. So the money is uh, subtracted from your uh, bidding price. And like this, there are materials. The all three of them have a different environmental uh, um, uh, um, uh, impact. <coughs> and uh, well, here you can see how it works. Uh, with the input, you get it from us. Uh, 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 to all this information from a national library. And it's all certified uh, uh, um, data. Uh, we won't use it. And this environmental cost indicator. And we start to work uh, or calculating on a project in the tender phase. Uh, as a contractor, you can uh, well analyze, review, choose new materials, change, improve. So you can optimize this project. Um, uh, yeah, so much you can use it. I don't know how many times. Uh, um, and you can re, uh, um, well um, improve and improve your project and find out what is the the lowest environmental cost indicator you can uh, get. And making it work, of course, because uh, uh, it still has to be safe. Uh, um, we use it uh, as an a criterion in the with the lowest environment indicator is best valued. Um, and one in uh, uh, the last year is um, using it uh, to challenge the market. Um, so at the beginning, we asked the market, uh, we have a reference design. Can you give us a project design with, uh, for instance, 20%? A lower environmental cost indicator, and then you get the maximum and uh, uh, meet discount. And you see, say 20% every uh, contractor will, uh, uh, well, will tender um, in which they deliver this 20%. So the next cent, uh, 40%, uh, we try to increase it with with uh, every uh, uh, project. Uh, um, uh, see how let your uh, your environment cost uh, indicator there. Uh, which I have a small uh, scheme here from some projects. Uh, you don't have to <laughs> build, uh, but you can see uh, we started with a uh, with a construction of a by way um, with 40% less environmental impact. Uh, um, then we had a few, uh, uh, few a little bit lower. Uh, um, the the sea trends uh, near Amsterdam was a really project, uh, and you can see um, by using Dubokalk and and asking for a low environmental cost indicator, we saved almost 90,000 tons of carbon emission. We did the same with another uh, lock in the center of the Netherlands. Uh, so uh, 23. Thousand tons of carbon emissions saved. Uh, and the last project, it was the A6. Uh, um, we also asked for 50% uh, low environment cost indicator, and then you would get uh, uh, awarded best in your meet criteria. And see, at the end, uh, the contract one also uh, made a bit with 52,000 uh, 52, tons of carbon emission reduction. So what we learned uh, from using uh, uh, the the last year, years, uh, like I said, we, we can increase the desired uh, reduction of the environmental impact. Uh, what I yet, but this, then you can add um, new materials uh, to this uh, national library. When you put a new material, which you think it's has a lower environmental impact, 
you to the um, uh, to the line. Um, and uh, um, it has to be verified, verified of course. Uh, you can do it within the next year uh, after winning your tender. So you don't have to make uh, cost before uh, on forehand, but you can do it within uh, the next uh, next year. We have also added energy consumption during uh, exploitation phase. Um, of course, uh, uh, and, and locks and, and uh, roads they use a lot of energy. Um, so energy consumption and especially in the DBFM context where maintenance is always uh, also included, you see there a, a large impulse to do, to reduce your energy uh, use. Um, yeah, what kind of uh, solutions were offered? Um, uh, well, uh, other types of concrete, uh, reducing uh, raw materials, uh, um, in, in a construction method, using uh, uh, of resulting in a lower amount of concrete needed. I'll come back to it later. Um, there are uh, uh, projects which, uh, which create their own energy for uh, exploitation phase. Um, Use of new materials, uh, which are added to this um, um, database, and uh, like I said, the seventh project I was talking about is the A6. Uh, you see where it's in the Netherlands. Uh, for some, for the people who don't know, the A6 is, um, and um, and uh, it's it's. Uh, it's a major transportation road from uh, uh, Amsterdam and Schiphol Airport uh, to the northern part of the Netherlands. Uh, we widened. Uh, and in Almere in, in 2022, uh, there will be the Floriade, the, the world uh, 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 on uh, um, Cree and, and, and flowers, and it's, it's a really big event. Um, and as you uh, uh, the uh, the plan for the is is uh, a design which is draped draped for the A6, um, and because the Floriade is, is such a big uh, event, uh, Almere demanded uh, that also the project would be uh, sustainable. Uh, so therefore, one of the minimum requirements for the A6 was it should be energy neutral. Uh, we asked for 50. Percent uh, lower environmental cost indicator. Uh, uh, like I said, we uh, the contractor who won uh, the tender, uh, they came up with a solution uh, which uh, reduced 52,000 tons of, of carbon emission, um, uh, 15,000 tons of energy reduction, and uh, due to another type of uh, foundation of the road. They use asphalt, and it resulted in about 40,000 tons of asphalt, uh, uh, asphalt reduction. Uh, so that uh, they also came up with smart solutions for transportation of sand. Uh, um, uh, it's generating its own uh, its own energy. Uh, um, they of recycle, so uh, transport uh, is always close by. Um, new material and uh, like I said, it's energy neutral and it's due to the uh, park, which is uh, uh, which you can see on the uh, most picture. Um, I think that is about what I wanted to tell. Yeah, yeah. So the uh, uh, so far for how we purchase a track Zwaardstad. Um. Yeah. Thanks, Jerome. Um, it's yeah, fascinating to see that um, that methodology there explained. Um, the first question for me: um, Who um, creates that method for the for that process? Do you have a like an expert team within Reichsvaterstadt, or do you have some consulting with external experts as well? And, uh, for what part you mean? And just in general, in general, in creating that um, all, all the different uh, measurements for that meet criteria there, and how how did you how did you bring it all together? Uh, well, Dubokok 
Talk is it's 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 a project it's uh, already ru running for a few years. Um and and uh, the meet criteria are always um uh there uh, I said uh, the project team decided to get with um, well the environment. So in this case uh, the city of Almere uh, um uh I think the province of uh Flevoland. Um so to get you at the beginning of the which which criteria are important for us, uh, um, uh, and you you add to your to your, in the tender phase. Um, so energy neutral was one of the solutions. Um, uh, it actually came from from the city of uh, uh, Almere. Uh, yeah. And now you see that uh, a lot of other tender projects at Rijkswaterstaat we all also ask for energy neutral. Because we see it's actually uh, uh, <laughs> easy to, but you see when you ask it, uh, you most times you do get a solution for energy neutral. Um, yeah. Not bad by the by the municipality itself in terms of as a, essentially an end user as such, um, wanting the the sort of low CO two approach. And 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 the carbon performance and and the, the whole double calc, it's it's. it's well, the German performance ladder is actually created by ProRail, um, the, the Dutch uh, authority for rail, ro rail roads. Mm -hmm. um, and Dubokalk is, de is developed by Rijkswaterstaat itself. Yeah, so especially with big projects, it's always uh, uh, well, a combination of all your stakeholders. Um, well, uh, <laughs> uh, around the table at the beginning. And, and, and find out what, what your demands are on, on sustainability and that, uh, well, how you can, can reach those goals together. Hmm. And are, um, during the tender process, and do the suppliers use the tool themselves, or do you take the information that they give you and send to you input into the, into the tool? Uh, everyone uh, does use the tool. Uh, it's, it's, it's already uh, uh, pretty common in the Netherlands. Uh, um and and like data so uh, the the um uh, part of the data it's it's coming from our reference design um so uh like the the, the tons of of concrete asphalt needed what we uh, have developed it in our reference design uh so they, the data comes from Rijkswaterstaat uh, um in the tender phase, uh, uh, all parties uh, did use Dubokalk to, to calculate their own uh, uh, um, version of the project. Okay, submit the results essentially of their. Um, uh, yeah. And uh, okay, we have a question from one of our audience. Um, so this is uh, from uh, Hai Ping Yu, and she said, Hi, Jerome, thank you. Thank you for the comprehensive presentation. Um, the sustainable uh, construction criterion is very impressive. And you apply this to all the construction projects procured by the government. Um, uh, uh, at the Rijkswaterstaat, we use it at the moment, uh, uh, I think, get 100% of our big uh, projects. Um, and, and not yet it's smaller, because it, it's a lot of work to uh, to our contractors uh, to make this uh, 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 reference design all on forehand. Uh, um, so projects we do we don't ask uh, all the time this Dubokalk uh, method. Uh, um, I think uh, um, uh, uh, communities or, or provinces don't do not use it yet, but there are. Uh, 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 I would say a lot of community of practice where we share the information and shared knowledge, and uh, uh, also other uh, uh, governments are also interesting in how how we purchase this on this way. Um, so yet on all governmental uh, uh, purchases, uh, unfortunately. Sometimes. <laughs> yeah, um. it's, it's a lot of work to to to. Uh, we have a lot of small. Project and, and when you have to ask every, every uh, tender uh, to make this dual calculation, 
it's a lot of money for those companies as well. So, uh, mm. Yeah, it has to be proportional yeah. to, to the size of the procurement. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, the uh, hyping also asks, uh, do you have uh, other English versions of the, the, the guidance and the and the tools available? Uh, yeah, I have a lot of information available. Uh, I think there are even, uh, Dubokok, the, the tool is also available in English. Uh, unfortunately, the, the data uh, um, uh, of all these materials is uh, <laughs> only available in Dutch at the moment. Uh, but it's also in this includes because a lot of uh, uh, analysis are based on the Dutch. Uh, um, uh, I said uh, how we build it in the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. um, but that, that's available, and I, I can send uh, uh, some links to, to YouTube uh, movies where you can find uh, uh, how Dubuco works and how we purchase it at Internetstaat. So I can send uh, I can send all the information uh, you want. We can we can yeah. share that with uh, with the, the participants um, yeah. um, after the after the webinar. That'll be you great. Can, or you can send email me uh, directly. Uh, my email address is in the uh, in the screen at the moment. I think. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, maybe just a final question, Jerome. Um, uh, there's uh, do you have any sort of lessons learned um, from the process, and maybe what would you do differently next time? Well, one of the lessons learned during, and that was actually during the GPP 2020 project where I showed you the results uh, from, uh, was that when you ask for a, 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 a minimal uh, reduction, you see that every company will uh, will apply it uh, with this reduction. So on the one hand, it's okay. Then on the, on the other hand, uh, there are no challenges to do a little bit more. Uh, we found out that when you set the goal too, too high, um, it's the other way around. Uh, you see that not everyone is it's, is able to reach the goal. So uh, there was one ask for 60 percent, and uh, I think there's only one uh, uh, contractor who could make it. Uh, that uh, large reduction of of, of um, environmental impact. Uh, so that's that's uh, lessons learned. We in every project, it's uh, we re really have to find out. Um, uh, what the one we can ask from the market, uh, and of course, uh, uh, sluice is something else uh, than a road, and uh, a road in the northern parts of the Netherlands is, is something else than a road in the southern part of the Netherlands. So, it's it, we are seeing, uh, to find the optimum in in uh, uh, the reduction we ask. I think that's one of the uh, main lessons learned. Uh, um, uh, well, I think it's interesting that another, another interesting uh, lesson learned is that when you ask it, uh, 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 contracting companies uh, they are already willing to to um, uh, to think together with you for a more sustainable solution, and when you only ask for lowest price. Um, uh, well, everyone will try to get the lowest price, no matter what the environmental impact. Uh, so you see that this, w this way of purchasing, uh, contracting companies are really uh, challenged to, to to come up with things more than than uh, low price procurement. Well, thanks very much, Sharon. Um, this is a, a a question to the other panel members as well. Um, maybe I'll start with Leon. Um, do you need some or lessons learned from, from your own particular procurement process, or maybe general for uh, for innovation procurement? I don't know. I'd say a couple of lessons would be one: you have to engage the market as far as possible. You have the opportunity to learn what the market has to offer, and also. Um, what requirements are. I think a lot of um, procurement activities take place without a full understanding of what organization wants to achieve from its procurement. At the time, um, for a lot of organizations, one of the key focuses is energy, energy use or energy consumption, carbon emissions, which is very important and one of the objectives that we are, you know, in organization in London where you know, quite keen to achieve, you know, being the sport that, um, 
our business cases with it with information on how much you save across the costs as well, such as maintenance costs and installation costs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know, a longer business case, and then you know, find that the the fight to um, you know do innovative procurement is a lot less than uh, than would previously be required because you get a lot more buy from more stakeholders and you know and other stakeholders can see the benefits for organization and Channel London at the moment needs to save um one pounds a year um because of um how much uh the funding that we are receiving from central government. So able to say, oh, if we buy these in the technologies, not only are we going to save in energy, but we're going to save across a variety of different variables. You know, you know, ultimately enables the organ to see this is the way forward in order to achieve not only carbon objectives and and environmental objectives, but also business business objectives. It's a win for environment as well as the organization okay uh, i believe there's also a few innovation events coming up that are, are you going to be at i've been invited uh, to present at two events um a uh, few months so one's next week in fact um 16th of june in brussels and uh, the next one is on the 18th and 19th of october in Tallinn, estonia and they're both organised by the European Union. And it's about assisting um, public organisations undertake innovative procurement. Okay. And also, that's also the uh, this, the event in Tallinn, as I mentioned there, is the uh, on the 17th of October, is the Procure Post Awards uh, ceremony. So the, the best way to attend that would be to enter the awards, and maybe you could be a, a finalist there, as uh, Leon was last year with our uh, our, our finals in, uh, in Malmö in Sweden. But Tina, maybe just as a, a, a final um, uh, wisdom, do you have any uh, any um, uh, lessons learned or any advice um, in terms of implementing uh, sustainable procurement? Of wisdom after hearing two fabulous uh, speakers, yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I couldn't agree more with what everybody said. In good is using the goals of your politicians. Also remembering to engage the people who are going to use the product afterwards. For me, it would be the kitchens, but for others, it could be end users also. Hear their point of view. So it's a lot of engagement with each other. I'll take a look of what did everybody else uh, who's procured for the same product, what have they done? So learn from each other experiences. That's I think, is also the important. So that's for me. Okay, great. Very much, Bettina. And uh, a big thank you to all three of our um, our panelists today and our presenters today. Um, I hope everyone enjoyed those presentations as much as I did. I think they're really fascinating to see the the um, the process behind those award-winning procurements. And uh, I hope um, everyone has a great afternoon. And we will see you again at the next Procure Plus webinar, which will be announced sometime in the future. Thank you very much, and have a great day. Thanks. Bye bye.